Hello, whilst I was planning future videos it became apparent to me that I need some sort of base game platform uh, in order to demonstrate some of the algorithms that I want to talk about. And so this video describes this very simple platform that I've developed. And uh, as you know on this channel I'm a bit of a fan of the retro aesthetic and so I've gone for the style of the 16-bit role-playing game. And I've got a whole series dedicated to coding your own role-playing game and I'll put a little link above. However, this video specifically isn't about developing a role-playing game, it's about establishing this platform. And I also want to show how you can use and abuse um, warped decal rendering in the Pixel Game Engine. And so today, we're going to develop this little editor. And you might think that this is quite a simple thing. And it is, really. You can move the cursor around, you can place a new block, place a few, and uh, you can hold down the tab key and choose from a particular texture what you want on the block. So far, so good, but so what, I hear you cry. We've done stuff like this plenty of times before on the channel. Well, of course, there's a small twist, and quite literally. We can rotate our world uh, to any angle we like. Because I always liked the idea when I was playing back on my Super Nintendo, the possibility of being able to rotate the worlds to find hidden doors and new pathways and things. And we can arbitrarily rotate to any given angle. And it doesn't matter what the angle is, it retains the two-dimensional aesthetic. And that's because I'm not using perspective transformations, I'm using orthographic transformations, and we'll look at that a little bit later. As well as being able to adjust the camera angle, we can also adjust the camera's tilt. Now certain tilts will start to make it look a bit strange because our eyes are not traditionally used to looking at orthographic transforms. And the way I've structured this application means we can actually have very large worlds. Fundamentally, even though the world looks three-dimensional, it is in fact a two-dimensional grid. And this means we can apply lots of the techniques that I've described in videos before. And we will see in this particular video that even though I've got a previous series on uh, creating a 3D graphics engine from scratch, we're actually not really going to rely on very many 3D techniques. There are some, uh, but we don't need to delve into the full matrix stack and transformations uh, like we normally would. The way I can draw 3D graphics in this sense is by using the draw warped decal function provided by the Pixel Game Engine. In fact, this is exactly what it was intended to do. We can exploit warping to provide pseudo 3D. And just before we get stuck in, there's no reason why you couldn't use a perspective transform instead of an orthogonal transform if you happen to like games made of cubes. But let's start by looking at the difference between a perspective projection and an orthographic projection. Here I'm looking at a scene from a top-down perspective, and I've got the player's eye here looking into the scene. There are four cubes uh, in this scene. Under a traditional perspective projection, we see things as they get further away get smaller. This is how we perceive the world around us. Uh, pretty much everything disappears to uh, what's known as a vanishing point somewhere on the horizon. And this happens because we take a point's coordinate in 3D space relative to that vanishing point, and we scale its x and y position on the screen by 1 over how far away it is from us. So our screen's x coordinate will become the object's x coordinate divided by the object's z coordinate. And the same applies to y. As the z coordinate gets larger by being further away from the camera, then the result of this calculation gets smaller, because it is inversely proportional to z. As these offsets get smaller, relative to that vanishing point, they get closer to it. And if we maintain this relationship consistently, we get this uh, three-dimensional effect. And we can scale everything this way. So if one of these cubes happened to move, let's say this one, and it was moving across the screen, and so was this one, at exactly the same velocity, this scaling would give us the effect that the cube closer to us is moving faster. And that's required to maintain this illusion of perspective, even though, in reality, they're moving at the same speed. Incidentally, this is why objects which are really far away never appear to move, like stars, for example, in the night sky. 
This approach is simplified for this explanation, and I have gone into a thoroughly detailed derivation of this in my three-dimensional graphics series. However, the principle is that x and y are related to z via an inverse proportional relationship. As z gets bigger, x and y get smaller. As z gets smaller, x and y get bigger. An orthographic projection, even though it sounds a lot more complicated, is in fact much, much simpler. In the simplest of terms, the orthographic perspective transformation simply ignores the z value. So whereas before we had a particular coordinate that existed at x, y, z, in world space that coordinate still exists there. But when we project it, we just ignore the z value. So now when we're looking into the scene, we don't get any perspective at all. There is no vanishing point, and this has the effect of making parallel lines remain parallel. On the scene here, we're quite familiar with the concept of field of view. Well, now it's almost as if the field of view is completely flat, and we're looking at it from all locations at once, rather than a single point. So what we see on the screen is in fact a direct straight ray normal to the screen. This style of projection means we simply cannot see the cubes that are behind the cubes at the front. However, we can still apply all of the traditional world transformations that we're familiar with. So let's say we uh, position the camera slightly to the uh, right here, and we've also moved it up a little bit, and we're looking down on the scene from an angle. Parallel lines remain parallel. So now we will see our four cubes. And even though they look three-dimensional, they don't follow these rules of perspective. In principle, this cube is the furthest away, but it is exactly the same size as the cube that is closest to the camera. And the cube's edges have remained in parallel. In fact, our entire world's axes have remained orthogonal to each other. And I find this approach is a great way of retaining a two-dimensional game aesthetic, even though your game is stored and manipulated as a 3D world. It isn't applicable to all scenarios, some things just simply will not look right, but used in the right circumstances, I quite like it. Working in an orthographic space like this also provides some optimization advantages, and we'll look at those later in the video. I mentioned at the start that what I really want to develop here is a platform that I can reuse for other projects later in the year. I think it would get a bit frustrating to have to recode a complete game base each time I wanted to describe a new algorithm, so we'll probably see this little editor and world renderer pop up quite a bit in the future. As such, I want to talk about the very basic data structures that I'm going to use, and I want them to be very basic because I've no idea how I'm going to change them in the future, and I want them to be quite flexible. The world is simply a 2D array of cells, and it has a width and a height, and in the top left we have 0, 0, and somewhere in the world we have a cell. This 2D array I'm going to wrap in a class called world, and the cell I'm going to wrap in a class called cell. Imaginative, huh? At this basic level, there is a few things that need to describe what a cell is. Firstly, is it a wall? I.e., do we actually render it as a cube, or do we just render it as some floor? The cube, as I hope we all understand, consists of six faces, and for each one of those faces I want some sort of ID that specifies what gets drawn for that face. And I'm adopting the convention of this is the south face, north face, east face, west face, top and floor. And the reason it's not bottom is because I never anticipate actually viewing the cube from underneath. It's always going to be viewed from above. So whereas these five faces all have the surface normals pointing outwards, the floor has it pointing inwards. I've gone ahead and created a skeleton pixel game engine application. It's 640 by 480 pixels, and each pixel is 2 by 2 screen pixels. And because there isn't much which is particularly novel or special in this code for this video, I'm going to go through it quite quickly. I'm going to add a little struct which represents our cell, with the wall flag for its existence, and uh, I'm going to use a 2D integer vector type for the ID. The ID represents what's going to be drawn on the surface of the cube for that particular face. And I've constructed a single file texture that contains all of the different faces for the cubes that I'm going to have in this game. 
At the top here I've got the various floors and then I've got the various wall types. I've also thrown in some generic colours, they may come in handy too. Now I've had this particular sprite pack for about 20 years. I don't know who the original author was and as such I'm uncomfortable about providing it as part of the source code. So if you do end up using this code you may need to hack together a small sprite of your own. Each of the tiles in this sprite are 32 by 32 pixels. And what I'm interested in is the starting coordinate of a particular tile, because that coordinate is all the information I need to tell me which face should I draw. And that's why I'm using a coordinate type to store that identifier. Next, I'm going to create a small class called world. I'll give it a constructor, and the world is fundamentally going to be a two-dimensional array. I'm deciding to mix things up a bit, so I'm going to use a vector for that rather than allocating it explicitly. I'll probably want to get the world size quite often, so I'm going to make that a public member variable. And I'm going to add a create function, which initializes the vector, which defines the size, and it also resizes the vector of the cells. I'm then going to add a get cell function. Now, normally when I do something like this, I would return a pointer to the specific cell. However, I want to do things a little bit differently, so I'm going to return a reference instead. Because, and I'm sure many of you will point out, you should never really return a pointer to a vector element. This does present a small problem though. One of the things I want to check for in my get cell function is that I'm actually addressing a coordinate that exists within the size of the world. And I'll do that translation as we have done in every single video. I'm sure you can all sing along now. Y times width plus X. However, what do I return if the cell lies outside of the world? Normally I would return a null pointer. I can't do that if I'm returning a reference, I've got to return something. So I'm going to create a special one-off cell called a null cell. And that's just something to satisfy the reference being passed back to whatever is called the get cell function. We don't care about the contents of the null cell, it's a null cell. All the walls could be zero, they could be whatever we want to not draw the cell, we can define that later. But this ensures that we're never operating on invalid memory. In our 2D array, storing the world. It is a bit doing things differently for the sake of doing things differently. So added to the main class of our game I'm going to add a variable world of type world and in our user create I'm going to construct a default world of 64 by 64 cells. I don't want to have to hand draw all of those every single time so I'm going to iterate through the size of the world touching every single cell and I'm going to basically make the entire world a floor. So I'm passing into the get cell function a vector 2D type. Because this function returns the reference, I can access the properties directly. I'm then going to set up the six IDs required. To try and make the engine as flexible as possible, I'm taking out all of the magic numbers. So here I've got a vector tile size. I'll need to add that into my game. And my tiles are 32 by 32 pixels. I've also got six possible faces. And just so we don't get confused when we're looking at the numbers, I'm going to name those faces in an enum. When you multiply two OLC vector types, it does element-wise multiplication. This is a very useful thing in 2D engines. This means we could use tiles that aren't 32 by 32. They could be rectangular tiles, and this would still work. What I'm passing in here is the coordinate of the tile in my texture. So for the floor texture, I'm passing in the third one along, on the top row. So if we go and look at the texture, so it's 0, 1, 2, 3. It's this sort of noisy grey. And my default walls are 0 along and 6 down. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's this wall down here. Pretty much everything in this demo application is going to be rendered as a decal. And decals always need a sprite as a source. And whilst I've been experimenting with decals, one of the things I've found myself doing is always creating a small little wrapper class called a renderable. And I find if I'm frequently always doing this, then it'll probably make its way into the Pixel Game Engine main core. A renderable is just a convenient way of simultaneously loading a sprite and a decal. You pass in the file path to the image you're interested in, it creates the new sprite, and it associates that sprite with a new decal. We can also put a destructor here just to make sure it's clean and tidy. Now we need to add the assets to the game. So I'm going to create a variable rend all walls of type renderable. And in on user create, I'm going to load the texture that I was showing before. 
All of the drawn side of the cubes that you can see are quadrilaterals. They're polygons with four sides. This makes sense because our tiles have four sides and the Pixel Game Engine understands that decals have four sides too. And it's the positioning of the four points of that quadrilateral which determine its warpage. So at some point I'm going to create a container of quads which need to be drawn to the screen. So I'll create a small structure in preparation for that. The world we are working in is actually a 3D world, so I need a quick and dirty 3D vector type. A quad is defined by these four points in world space, X, Y and Z, and I'm also going to include a 2D vector type which mirrors the texture coordinate that we're interested in for drawing that quad. Before we can start drawing things though, we need to store some information about our camera. The camera is always going to look at a particular point on the 2D plane that represents the floor of our world. And we have an angle around the y-axis, which is normal to that floor plane, that allows us to rotate the world. I'm also going to store the camera's pitch, which is the rotation in the x-axis relative to the screen. Finally, I'm going to store the camera's zoom, which is how close do we get to the objects. And we'll see that in orthographic space, Zoom is implemented a little bit differently to how you might expect. Every tile in the game world can be represented as a cube, so I'm going to add a function called createCube that will generate the vertices in the right place for us. CreateCube returns eight 3D vectors in the form of an array, and it takes in the 2D cell coordinate, which tile is it in our world, the angle of rotation of the world, the angle of pitch, F scale is going to be our zoom, and the 3D location of where the camera is in the world. Now, because I like to keep things understandable on this channel, I've separated out the following mathematical procedures. And each stage is going to result in a cube with a slightly different transformation. We'll start by defining the unit cube. So this is a cube with no transformation sat at the origin. And for those with a keen eye, you may have noticed something rather strange. Why is our unit cube using the F scale value rather than one? Well, it's just a small optimization. I've no need to multiply those ones by F scale. But I'm also going to be applying all of these transformations in screen space. And that's a bit different to a standard way of thinking when it comes to 3D applications, where we would normally take this world coordinate space and translate it into screen space. Working with orthographic perspectives means I can work directly in screen space. And this can be a little bit more intuitive to think about. Our unit cube is created at the origin, but the first thing we'll need to do is translate it to its position within the world. And I'll do this, but also take into account the camera's location in the world. So this is the tile coordinate, and it's multiplied by our scaling value, and I offset it by the camera. You'll see that I've translated the 2D X and Y coordinate of the cell within the world into the X and Z coordinate within the 3D world. The unit cube still exists within the pixel space of the screen. Now I want to apply the world rotation, and even though I said we were going to avoid matrices, fundamentally this is a little matrix calculation for a rotation in the y-axis around the origin. So our cube has been offset to its world location, and now that is rotated around the origin. The odd thing to think about here is I'm still doing all of this in screen space which means I don't need to create a view matrix or a camera matrix or an equivalent of. Once we've rotated the whole world around the y-axis, I then want to change the pitch. So this is the angle we're looking at the world from the side, kind of. And this is again just a little 3D matrix rotation around the x-axis. The x-axis is relative to going across the screen horizontally, and before the y-axis was relative to going up and down the screen vertically. Now it's time to do our orthographic projection. And you'll see it's actually incredibly trivial. All we're doing really is offsetting our world cube's coordinate by half the screen. So this ensures that the camera's focal point is in the middle of the screen and not the top left. What you'll notice about this particular projection is that there is no influence from the Z coordinate. We still pass the Z coordinate through because it's useful, but we don't manipulate our X and Y values based on that Z. In the source file that's accompanying this video, and you can get that from the GitHub in the link below, I've also included this code, which is a generic form of the orthographic transformation. I can optimize it to be this simple because I'm assuming we're looking at the entire screen, and so far all of our transformations have been in screen space. 
However, if you wanted to project to a viewport, say a smaller sub-rectangle on the screen where you might have some additional inventory information or other things you don't want to render to the whole screen, uh, this is the generic form to do that, where you can specify explicitly the left, right, top, bottom, near and far boundaries of your world. Even so, you'll see that there is no influence of the z-axis on the x and y axes. So that's included in the download, but I'm going to remove it for now. The last thing to do is return our projected cube. So let's just have a little recap of what's going on. We're passing in the particular cell coordinate in the world of a cube and the camera parameters. We create a unit cube. We then translate it to its position in the world. We rotate that world around the y-axis. We rotate the world around the x-axis to give us some tilt. And then we project the cube, which in this case is just offsetting it so that the look at point of the camera is in the middle of the screen and not the top left. And that's that. We result with an array of transformed x, y and z coordinates for our cube. We now know where they are in screen space. Now it's time to think about drawing some stuff and we'll do this in on user update. I mentioned before that effectively we're going to need a container filled with quadrilaterals, the things we're going to draw. So I've created a vector of my s quad type. And I'm making no attempt at optimizing here. I'm going to draw the entire world all the time, even if I know I can't see most of it. So I'll create two nested for loops that iterate through every single cell in the world. And for each cell, we're going to get the quads that we want to draw. And those quads represent the faces of the cubes. And I'm going to tidy this up by creating a function called getFaceQuads, which takes in the cell's x and y coordinate, also passes in the camera information, which is important. And it's going to append to that vector any quads that represent that particular cube. I'll add the body for this function here. And what's important is that we're passing in this vector by reference at the end. In order to know which faces we need to construct, we're going to have to create the cube. So here I'm calling the create cube function we just created. And just to keep the typing down, I'm going to create a small reference to the cell at the location. And this is important because all create cube does is construct some geometry for us. It doesn't really know anything about texturing information. Conceptually, this is how the unit cube is constructed. And I've identified my vertices in the following order. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now I'm drawing this out, there's probably better ways to do it, but it really doesn't matter. What it tells me is that if I want to define the southern face of my cube, which is this one, that I need to use points 0, 1, 2 and 3. I want the sprite to appear kind of correct. So if we had the door sprite, for example, then I want my quadrilateral, when I draw it as a decal, to kind of reflect the correct thing. Now, decals are drawn in a slightly different order. You specify the points to a decal like a U shape. So if I wanted to define the southern face, then the quadrilateral needs to be formed of the points 3, 0, 1 and 2. And this ordering is important because it will change the direction the sprite faces. And we have to think about it relative to the rest of the cube. So if I wanted to draw the northern face, then it's important that I remember from this angle that it's specified the other way round. So for north, I want to draw 6, 5, 4, and seven. It's really just about maintaining consistency across the faces. Therefore, I'm going to create a little lambda function to help me define the faces of the cube, where I can pass in my ID of which vertex I'm looking at and which face those vertices form. My returned projected cube array contains those vertices in screen space. So I'm just going to index into that array which ones I need to make up that face. The final element is the texture coordinate that we're choosing to draw for that face. So here we have decoupled the quad that we're drawing from the tile in the world. If the cell is not considered a wall, then all we need to provide is a quad that reflects the floor. So I'll call my make face lambda with the indices that represent the floor and tell it to extract the floor's texture coordinate for that particular cell. If we're not drawing floor, then we're drawing wall. And walls consist of five visible faces. We have the south wall, the northern wall, the eastern wall, the western wall, 
and the top. We can't see the floor. We may change this in the future. If our walls contained transparency information, we might actually want to render the floor. But for now, I'm assuming that the walls are solid. Each time we call the makeface lambda function, we add that quad to our vector of quads, which means our get face quads function returns all of the information necessary to draw that particular tile cube to the screen. In fact, I don't need this to do anything else. So now let's draw these quads. First thing I'm going to do is clear the screen to black. And then I'm going to iterate through the vector of quads I want to draw. And I'm going to call the draw partial warped decal function, which is a pixel game engine function which will take in our screen space quad coordinates and the texture coordinates that we need and draw it with the appropriate warped distortion on the screen. It's going to get its image source from the rend all walls renderable we created earlier. And the screen is two dimensional, but my quadrilateral contains three dimensional coordinate information. We've already done the orthographic perspective transform, so we know that the Z information is now irrelevant. So here I pass in the four 2D vector coordinates just comprising of the X and Y components of the 3D vectors. Then I pass in the source texture coordinate. And finally, I need to pass in the texture size. In principle, those last two parameters specify the coordinate of the tile that we're interested in top left and gives me the width and the height of the full tile. So it's going to extract this one tile and warp it between the four screen space coordinates that we've supplied. I think at this point it's good to take a look. Let's make sure things are working. And well, what we can see is that the bottom right is certainly textured with some sort of tiled texture, and it is our floor texture that we've specified, but I have no means of interacting with this application. So at the start of our onUser update function, I'm going to handle some user input. The W and S keys are going to adjust the tilt of the camera up and down. The D and A keys are going to handle the rotation of the camera. I'm going to use Q and Z keys to handle the zoom. So all this is going to do is change the scale of our unit cube originally, because don't forget all of these transformations are in screen space, and that's the distinct difference between doing a genuine 3D world projections and what we're doing here. So now that we've got control of those, let's try it again. So if I press the A and D keys, I can rotate my world around. At the moment, we're centered on the very top left zero zero of the world. We'll need to add in a cursor, but we'll do that in a minute. The W and S keys adjust the pitch, and I think you can just start to see that happen. Q and Z allow us to zoom in and out, and here we can see the texture is getting larger in this case as we're zooming in. And if I keep this held down, we'll zoom all the way out to see the whole world. In fact, I can rotate the whole world around, and perhaps now we can see pitch. So we are starting to get this 3D effect, and we're also starting to get this sort of wonkiness that is associated with orthographic perspectives. It looks wonky because we're so tuned to things looking in perspective uh, in 3D applications. What we can see is that the edges of our entire world remain parallel, and they shouldn't in a normal perspective situation. You'll often find that mechanical design, CAD software, uh, the designers prefer to work in this perspective so they can see that things are the same length uh, regardless of how deep they are on the screen. I want to add in some convenience functions to snap the rotation to given angles so we can always line up uh, with the direct axes of the world. Let's take a look. So if I press the different keys on the numpad we can look at the world directly along a specific axis or an XY axis or XZ in this case. To move around the world, we're going to need a cursor, and the cursor is going to represent a particular cell in our world. Since the world can be a lot larger than what we can see, it's quite useful to also adjust the camera position depending on the location of this cursor. So I'm going to do exactly that. And I'm going to make the arrow keys responsible for positioning the cursor. Now, I could do clever things and have it responsible for positioning the cursor relative to the direction and the angle you are looking at the scene, but for now I'm keeping it really simple. So if you're looking at the scene from uh, the left-hand side, the cursor keys are not going to be translated accordingly. But here I'm just responding to the key being pressed, adjusting the cursor's value accordingly, and clamping it to the size of our world. So we can't position the cursor outside of the world. And since we have a cursor now, 
we have the ability to select a specific cell. So if the spacebar is pressed, I'm going to toggle the wall flag of our cell. Let's take a look now. Well, I can move the screen around, but I can't see a physical cursor, but I'll, I'll place a cell. And there we go. We can see that the cube is now generated. I can place several cells. Tell you what, I'll just zoom in a little bit. And with the W and D keys, we can start to rotate the world. But we can see there is now a problem. The order in which we want to draw things is quite important, or else our perspective is completely confused. But hey, one problem at a time. Let's first of all draw a cursor. To draw the cursor, I'm going to do exactly the same process. I'm just going to draw an additional tile on top of the cube that already exists. In fact, I'm going to use the same cube geometry. I'm just going to change the nature of the decal. So here is the selection decal that I want to use. It's a yellow boundary that fades to alpha in the middle. Since this is another resource, I'm going to add an additional renderable, which is our selection cursor. After we've drawn all of the visible quads, I'm then going to draw the cursor. And the process is pretty much the same. I'm going to clear this temporary vector of quads now. And I'm going to get the face quads for the item that is at the location of the cursor. And in exactly the same way as above, I'm going to draw the quads that represent that tile, but I'm using my selection decal instead. So let's take a look. So now we can see the cursor quite nicely. I'll just zoom in. And it follows it around. And if I place the cube, the cursor itself becomes a cube because it's just drawing the same faces, just with a different decal. So now we can navigate the world a little bit more sensibly. But let's now address the elephant in the room. It looks rubbish. What we see here are things being drawn in the incorrect order. So we're typically scanning from the top left to the bottom right. And we look at which faces are visible for a given cube. But then on the next cube down, we're drawing over what we've already put there. We need to do some sort of sorting. And rather ironically, even though we've completely rejected the Z component of all of the vertices that we're drawing in order to see the textures, we're going to use the Z component to sort things in the correct order. Because the Z component in world space, which don't forget right now our world space is also our screen space, is still valid. It's still further away from the camera. And this is actually really trivial to do because all hail the standard library for providing us with a sort function. The vector of quads that we've got, even though we're only using the X and Y components when we're drawing things, still have the Z component, and that Z component is still accurate. So I'll call the sort function passing in a custom lambda function that determines how we compute the average Z value for a given quad. In fact, that's exactly what I'm doing. I add up all of the Z components for each face and divide it by four. And then I'll compare those and return true or false accordingly so the sort algorithm can do its work. Let's take a look now. Here I've drawn a few cubes, and as I rotate, we now see that things are drawn in the correct order relative to where the camera is. The nice thing is our selection cube we chose to draw later, so you can still see it if it's behind an object. As I move the selection cursor around, it yields an interesting observation. For this particular cursor, we see there are five faces being drawn. Yet, of course, in a 3D world, if we're looking at a cube, we can only ever see three faces maximum at a given time. This means we're drawing twice as much than we need to. Therefore, it's worth rejecting faces that we can't see. And here is where orthographic projection can come and help us. Traditionally, to work out whether or not a face is visible, we need to extract the normal to the face. And if that normal vector has a Z component, which is away from the camera, then clearly we cannot see the face. So we only want to accept faces that have normals with positive Z components. Under a perspective projection, we would have to do this for all cubes, because the very nature of perspective means we can see different sides of the cube depending on where we're looking at. However, in our simple application here, all of our cubes are identical. And this is a very important thing. 
It doesn't matter how far away they are from the camera or where they are in the world as we discussed before, everything remains parallel and axis aligned. So regardless of rotation and orientation, I will always see the same three faces of our axis aligned cubes. So I only need to check for six surface normals in our entire scene to work out which surfaces are visible. This is a great optimization that we can do because it's an orthographic transform. So let's add in a function which determines the visible faces for any cube in our system. I've added an array here, of six booleans. And I'm going to add in an additional function, calculate visible faces. And this will take in a particular cube. To this function, I'm going to add a little lambda function called check normal, which is going to look at three vertices of our cube's face and perform the two-dimensional cross product. Now, that might not make much sense to the mathematicians out there. Uh, we all are very familiar with three-dimensional cross products. It's the returns a vector which is orthogonal to the two input vectors. We can do something similar in 2D by assuming that one of those axes is a plane and therefore will provide a scalar result which is the magnitude of this sort of virtual vector coming out of that plane. And so we can use the sign of this magnitude to tell us whether or not that particular quadrilateral surface is wound away from us or wound towards us. And I can do this for all six faces of our cube. I'm just choosing the indices we've already specified for the faces. And in fact, you'll see they're quite similar. So for the floor, it's 401 there. And down here, when we were making the floor, it's just 401. It's just the first three indices. We just need three points on that particular face. So if we call this function with a cube, it will set our six Boolean variables to tell us whether or not that face is visible. And therefore, when we're creating our faces and adding them into the vector of quads to be rendered, we should check against this array of Booleans to see if the corresponding face is in fact visible. This way, we'll only draw what we can see, and we'll need to do this for all faces. So now when we're generating the quads to be drawn, if any of them have a surface normal that points away from the camera, we're not even going to add them to the list of things to be drawn. Now you might think that's really expensive. We can't do that for every single tile or cube that we can see in the game. And because we're using an orthographic perspective transformation, we don't have to. We only have to do it for a single cube because all of our cubes are identical, regardless of where they are on the screen. And so I'm going to use our create cube function again. I can pass in any cube coordinate, it doesn't matter. But what does matter is the angle of the camera and the zoom and things like that. And based on the geometry returned from that function, I'm going to call our calculate visible faces function, which will set those booleans. So now when I run the application, and I'll place a few walls, even though it looks the same as before, we're only rendering the things we can see. And we can prove this by looking at the cursor selection cube. It now only consists of the three visible faces, whereas before it consisted of the faces we can't see. We've got one thing left to add now, and that is a way to select the textures from our source texture to paint on the walls. We need an edit mode, and this is so simple and trivial, you might actually smile. I'm going to add in a 2D vector tile cursor, which represents the selected tile within our texture. And in on user update, I'm going to be responsive to the tab key being held down. So you hold down the tab to bring up edit mode. And if we're in edit mode, uh, we don't want to do anything else. We're not drawing the rest of the scene. So I'll just return early. You're going to select which tile you want with the mouse. So for convenience, I'm going to get the mouse's coordinates and store them in a vector. From the top left of the screen, I'm going to draw the sprite. This is the sprite that contains all of the tiles. I need to know which sprite I've got selected. So I'm going to draw a rectangle at the right location. So our tile cursor multiplied by the tile size. And if the mouse is clicked, then I'm going to specify the tile cursor position to be the mouse's coordinates integer divided by the tile size. And that's it, that's edit mode. So we'll click play. And if I hold down the tab key, we see our sprite appear and I can click on an individual tile and we can see it gets a nice border around it so we know which one it is. All that remains is a mechanism to assign which particular tile is selected to the given face of the cell at our cursor's location. And I'm going to do that rather unelegantly by assigning the faces uh, south, north, east, west, top and bottom to numeric keys. So if you press the one key, we're going to affect the northern face of the cell. We just get the cell at the current cursor's location, we get the face, and we set 
the ID, which remember is a texture coordinate, to wherever our tile cursor is in the texture space multiplied by the tile size. So here I've got a cube in the middle of the screen and I want to paint this particular texture, uh, it's like a fairly menacing knight, uh, onto this face. And so I know that the one key represented the northern face. And this is the northern face because up here is our top left, that's our zero zero, so technically we can't see the southern face at the moment. And if I rotate the camera, we can see we've only applied it to that face. If I now press the two key, we can apply it to that face. The three key will apply it to that one. The four key will apply it to that one. Five applies it to the floor. And six applies it to the top. Okay, one little final bonus thing to add. And that is, as we're moving the camera around, it can be a bit jarring to just move in these fixed intervals. There's a really quick little hack you can do to make smooth movement in games. Instead of specifying an angle directly, we'll give it a target instead. And I'll just create that variable up here. Once we've got this target, we can now slowly adapt our actual camera angle towards the target by looking at the difference, multiplying it by some number, and that will be the speed of that adaptation, and f elapsed time. So let's take a look now. So I'll add in some buildings. And now as I move the camera around, it's a far more pleasing transition. And so there you have it. I know it's been a bit quick this video, uh, but I wanted to establish this simple little platform because we'll be coming back to it uh, in quite a few future videos. We've looked at how we can exploit orthographic transforms uh, to buy us some simplicity in rendering uh, what I think is a rather quaint two-dimensional aesthetic, but using fundamentally a 3D data source, because the world is easier to represent in 3D in this instance. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this video, please give me a big thumbs up, have a think about subscribing, the source code is available on the GitHub, come and have a chat on the Discord server, and I'll see you next time. Take care.